This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and Shifting the Paradigm. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. This is Ray Sobs from the Unex Network, and you're listening to Shifting the Paradigm with the intrepid Christina Gomez on the X. You're listening to the Unex Network, KUNX DV, Kansas City, Missouri. Welcome to Shifting the Paradigm. I'm Christina Gomez on the Paradigm Shifts channel and on the X, the new mainstream KUNX digital broadcasting talk radio. Are you ready for this? Because we're about to embark on an hour and a half of UFO shenanigans and paranormal adventures. Right here is where we look and think outside the proverbial box. We jump down those rabbit holes where you get a red Tic Tac instead of a red pill. First off, make sure you subscribe and share these shows on social media to those who you think are having their minds and eyes open to the reality of the UFO mystery. All of these shows are great primers, and in the push for more clarity, transparency, and disclosure, the more voices demanding answers, the better. Let's get into some unusual news from this last week. BBC News stated that NASA's Hubble telescope has found the largest comet ever seen by astronomers. It is believed that the comet's icy nucleus has a mass of about 500 trillion tons and is 85 miles or 137 kilometers wide. The ice that makes up the nucleus of a comet isn't just frozen water, but also super cold methane, ammonia, and carbon dioxide ices are also in the mix, along with dust, rocks, and other debris from the solar system. However, the closest the comet will get is 1 billion miles away from the sun, and that won't be until 2031. It was first spotted in 2010, but only now has Hubble confirmed its size. Over 3,743 comets are known to exist in our solar system at this time. Before this discovery, the previous largest comet was only 60 miles wide. So this new one is 25 miles wider and the largest comet found so far. In other news, Pastor Alex Tan recently captured footage of a very strange creature that he discovered on a beach in Queensland, Australia. Describing the find as alien-like, Tan explained that he had discovered something weird before panning the camera down to provide a closer look at the remains splayed out across the sand. He said, I was just really interested, but what the heck was this? The discovery was made on March 21st, but has been getting some serious attention since. According to social media video service agency Storyful, he had described the creature as having human-like hands, a long lizard tail, a nose like a possum, and patches of black fur. The footage left social media users speculating over exactly what type of creature it could be. According to University of Queensland Associate Professor Stephen Johnston, however, the most likely explanation is that it is simply a swollen, waterlogged bushtail possum. What do you think it looks like? Is the professor just trying to explain away something unknown, or is it really just a possum? 
With the news out of the way, let me talk about my guest. Jessica Jones is a paranormal investigator and remote viewer based in Northwest Georgia. She is an active field researcher and member of Enigma Research Group, Anomalous Studies and Observation Group, and North Georgia Cryptid Researchers. All these teams are action-oriented groups which conduct field research associated with all things paranormal, but particularly Bigfoot. These groups have obtained groundbreaking evidence at several paranormal hotspot hubs in southeastern United States compared to the infamous Skinwalker Ranch. What sets her team apart from other groups is that they are well-trained in remote viewing. Jessica, thank you for joining us on Shifting the Paradigm. How are you doing today? Hey, thanks for having me. I'm doing amazing. How are you? I'm doing really well, and I'm really excited for today's interview. You are an active paranormal investigator, remote viewer, and a Bigfoot investigator. Can you share with us how this all got started for you? I mean, what got you interested in these different topics? Well, you know, I've been interested since I was a kid. And, you know, when I was in elementary school, I was going to the library and I was checking out books about ghosts. And, you know, we'd have those book fairs and I'd always uh, gravitate towards the solar system books and UFOs and Bigfoot and fortune tellers and things like that. So I always had an interest in it. Now, when I was a kid, I used to take my little nap mat out to the front yard at night and I would watch for UFOs in the sky. And, uh, you know, and I had experiences with ghosts and seeing dead people, people who had passed on when I was a teenager. So, you know, I just had a natural um connection to it in some weird way. And uh, and as I grew into a young adult, you know, I was still seeing dead people and uh, and still had a fascination in all of it. And uh, eventually, I guess, I don't know, my interest took me into, um, well, I was living in a haunted house as well. So that was kind of why I was seeing all these dead people all the time. <laughs> but I got an interest in um, Bigfoot because I had got, joined my mother at a, a weekly meetup at a meeting uh, on Wednesday nights in a local friend's house where they had people come in and talk about metaphysical things and supernatural uh, events and Bigfoot, for instance. And one one Wednesday night, a group of fellows were coming in who were Bigfoot field researchers out of Georgia. And so my mom invited me to go. She thought I would really enjoy it. And so I went and these guys had this amazing information and real evidence. And I could tell by just listening to them that they really believed in Bigfoot and what they were doing. And so I was totally intrigued by it. And I, after the, the presentation was over, I went and asked them, you know, where's a body? You know, if you guys, you know, if, if this thing's real, where's a body? Where's more evidence like the poop and things like that, you know, just normal stuff that everybody wants to know. And the, the guy saw that I was really interested. And so they invited me to go on an expedition with them. Okay, so of course I went. Okay, it was, it was like taking one of those risks. Like I didn't know these guys, but what better way to learn and find out for myself than just, you know, getting a tent, buying some hiking shoes and uh, getting some gear and going into the woods with some complete strangers. <laughs> so... I um so I did that and uh it was the best decision I ever made. So, you know, when people say you just got to take a leap of faith sometimes, that's exactly what that is, is taking a leap of faith into the unknown literally. Because that's what I did and um that first weekend that I was investigating Bigfoot and going out there and just just taking it all in, right? I um I, I experienced a lot more than Bigfoot that weekend. Okay, so I kind of had UFO activity. We had a low flying UFO over our heads that weekend. There was not only Bigfoot activity, but UFOs, like interdimensional stuff, like all sorts of really weird paranormal phenomenon. And that includes ghosts and like trickster spirits and stuff like that. And we were way up deep, deep into the mountains where there are no other people. Okay, and so... It made for a very interesting weekend. But by the end of the weekend, the guys uh, were pretty impressed, I think, with me being so brave that they asked me to join their team. And I think they did that because they knew that I brought a lot of high strangeness with me when I came. 
I believe. So, uh, so I joined their team and the head of my team is actually an amazing remote viewer and, uh, and he's uh, formally trained in it. And so when we were having all these paranormal experiences out in the field that we really couldn't explain and we knew there was more to it, but we just didn't know for sure. He decided to teach my entire team remote viewing. So I have spent the last, it's been 11 years now since that happened. I've spent the last at least 10 of those years re doing remote viewing. And so that's how I got into uh, Bigfoot and remote viewing. And I can't really say that I'm just a Bigfoot field researcher now, which I do spend a lot of time out in the woods. We do a lot of Bigfoot field research. Um, but I'm more of just an overall paranormal field investigator and researcher because once we put the foot in the door, I got my foot in the door with Bigfoot, everything else opened up. And I, my team has experienced everything from, like I said, the ETs and the UFOs to portals. My team actually has a portal documented or what we consider to be a portal documented on film through a FLIR, which is um, like a heat signature device, okay, out in the field. And two of my teammates were sent to investigate it while they were being filmed through the FLIR and their heat signatures disappeared. And they said the entire environment changed inside of this gigantic cube that appeared out of nowhere. Um, they couldn't see it with their own eyes, but we could see it with the heat signature device. And they said the entire environment changed. They could not see the stars anymore. The, the vegetation under their feet had changed from rough vegetation to smooth. And um, they knew something was up. So they turned around and walked out. And we have that all documented. So we have experienced Bigfoot orbs. Okay, we have orbs everywhere all the time. Uh, and, you know, all sorts of just weird things, you know. So, um once you start doing Bigfoot field research, or in research and you're out there enough, you start realizing there's a lot more than just Bigfoot out in those woods. So, um, but that's how it, it pretty much got started. Um, you know, I, um, I, I do remote viewing, but I'd always had a fascination in um, tarot card reading and, and you know, I've, I've kind of been on a spiritual journey of sorts. So um, I would say that Bigfoot is part of that spiritual journey and I, uh, you know, that's uh, it's very interesting to look at it that way. Absolutely. And just in that, in those first few minutes, you covered so many topics that I want to hit on. I don't know where to yeah. start. But one thing that really catches my attention uh, are portals. I They just fascinate me. And you brought that up. In that story that you just mentioned, what kind of environment did they describe about the other side? Did it seem like there was another planet or in another dimension? I mean, that that really gets my curiosity going. Did they explain what they saw on the other side of that portal? They did. Well, they only stepped into it briefly. Okay, so... And we call it a portal because we just don't know what else to call it. Um, as they walked up to it, it a, a gigantic cube appeared in the middle of the field in an open field that we investigate because we've had a lot of high strangeness out there, including Bigfoot activity. And so when they walked up to it, they didn't know they were going inside of it because they could not see it. They could only <clears throat> go where they were being guided by the people that were watching them through their equipment, through the thermals and their flares. So they got up to it and they walked to where it was and they said it was like walking into a black velvet curtain, a dark curtain and the temperature changed, it got colder. And they went from stepping through briars and tall grass and, you know, kind of muddy ground to smooth ground, like nothing there, like no grass or anything. It was just a smooth ground. And um, and they looked around and the stars were gone. So they had been able to see this beautiful night sky out there because we're out in the middle of nowhere. And when they got inside, inside is what we call it, um, the, the it's like it had a ceiling to it or something because the because the stars were no longer visible. Um, but they did not, they didn't go any further than that. And thank goodness they didn't because they, as soon as they realized 
that something was off, they'd turn back and walked backwards out. Okay. They, or they'd turned around and walked out. Now, both of these gentlemen are former military and one of them is uh, former law enforcement as well. Special forces, you know, these guys are very um, switched on humans. They're also remote viewers. Okay. So it's, it's easy for us to pick up subtle energy shifts and uh, temperature changes and things like that. Like we notice those things maybe more than the average person, but, um, but as soon as they walk out of it, this, the square shrunk down to a smaller size and it moved and then it disappeared. My question is, while on this topic, just to confirm the big cube, it, it was seen with the FLIR camera or did you get a, a screen capture of the footage of the cube? It was caught with the actual camera. We have video evidence of the portal is what we call it. And so we really we, we really call it the black cube, but we, we also refer to it as the portal for lack of a better term. Um, and of course, we don't know where it would take us if you know we had stayed in it but my team actually had to come up with a protocol in case we encountered one of these ever again um and we're trying to get volunteers to see you know who wants to go back in you know because i really don't um I, you, you don't know if if those two gentlemen had not walked out when they did they could have very easily gone with it so you know it, it to me Maybe that explains where a lot of the missing people are going out of the woods and the forest. If you're familiar with the, the David Politis Missing 411 series, there are a lot of people who go missing in the woods and in our national parks and state parks and, you know, all over the place. So is this where those people are going? I mean, it's a it's a, a good question to ask. And I'm not sure who has the answers to that. But um Hopefully, hopefully we'll get those answers one day here in the near future. And it's really all going to stem from people like my, you know, people on my team speaking out about it and just making the public aware of these boxes that could potentially show up in the woods. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a mom and I like to take my son out on hikes and I don't want to encounter one of these things with my son out there. You know, if there's something like this in the forest, it'd be good for us to know the dangers of it and um, and learn what maybe the higher ups know or our government, you know, who we don't know if this is um, alien technology or if it's something with our military or government or if it's something natural. So and, you know, I'm not sure it's natural because of the shape of it and um and also it looked like it might've had a door on the front of it and a couple of crosses inside of it. So <laughs> it gets more weird uh, the more I we get into it, but it's, um, it's definitely an interesting phenomenon. So then I would have to ask, would you walk through a portal if you saw one? Me personally, no, I would not. Um, you know, I'm a mom and I have a, a young child at home. And so I have to take that into consideration. Um, also, the two gentlemen that walked into the portal actually came out of it with extremely bad health conditions. And we can't 100% uh, say that that was why they both got sick. But, um, but we do take Geiger countings and uh, we have geiger meters which measure radiation and there were there were spikes at the time when uh when they walked over there so um it does show that there was some radiation involved and um one of the gentlemen uh had an aggressive form of cancer come back and the other one uh, had a heart condition after that and he's since passed away so we have to be really careful you know uh, being a field researcher is pretty dangerous at times. And, and that is proven by what we experienced out there. Now, if you asked, uh, my friend Bob is actually one of the guys who, who walked in, who is still living today. And uh, he is one of my teammates and the head of the North Georgia cryptid researchers and uh, the head of the dog man, um, the North American dog man project, uh, Southeastern region director, actually. So, um, He's a tough, he's a tough dude. And uh, I don't think he would, he would go back in actually. Um, but we did make a protocol, you know, my team, 
uh, we had to create a protocol for if we ever do encounter one again. And part of that protocol at first was, you know, strapping somebody to a rope around their waist and letting them walk in. And then, you know, us try to pull them out if they didn't, you know, return and stuff like that. You know, you have to get kind of creative when you've never experienced stuff like that before. And I, it sounds kind of crazy and it sounds kind of funny, but you know, we're, we're just trying to figure out what this thing is and, um, and where it goes and why, why was it there? You know, is this where Bigfoot is coming in and out of our environment? Is this where UFOs are entering and exiting our, our atmosphere? I mean, it leaves us with more questions than answers because it's such an, an odd occurrence. And, um, you know, it's not the first time that we've encountered a portal. It's just the first time we documented one. <laughs> okay. So um, we had never seen one through a FLIR before. But uh, one of the gentlemen who walked into the portal, the one who is deceased today, he actually had encountered one on another trip that we were on in a different area of the South. Uh, you know, I don't give our locations away because um, for the integrity of our research, because we research several areas all over the South in different states and different areas and different regions. And uh, in every place that we Research is very similar to the Skinwalker Ranch out in Utah, uh, as far as the activity goes. So um, there's a lot, a lot of weirdness out there, and you know, I just don't like the idea of having hikers and people that are camping out, especially with their families, going out places like where we go and walking into a portal and maybe never being seen again. Um, it's a it's a real danger. It it seems like it. Whenever you're dealing with the unknown, in a sense, it is dangerous. Yeah. And on the topic of being a part of research groups, you're an integral part of several paranormal investigation teams. And what makes your teams different from the rest is that there are members who are trained remote viewers. From your experience, being able to remote view your subject, is it easier than using equipment or harder? And can you explain why? Yeah, well, we still use the equipment and all. Uh, the remote viewing is actually used for more of um, investigating from a whole new angle, okay? So we take equipment out, and I personally don't take a whole lot of equipment anymore. I used to take my equipment, and uh, and I have all of that stuff. But, you know, I don't see a need to use it um, at this point because I'm not out there trying to prove anything to anybody, okay? I'm out there more to experience what's going on out there. And, um, and so, but depending upon which team I'm out there with, you know, some of the teams do a lot of the measurements and take the equipment. And then another team doesn't that much. We're out there more to experience it and to communicate. And let me tell you, the team that doesn't take as much equipment out is my remote viewing team, the guys that, um, that do the remote viewing with me. So, you know, we like to use remote viewing um, by just scoping a place out before we go out there. Or if we have a really strange occurrence and we don't know what happened or we want to look deeper into it, that's when we remote view it, okay? And it doesn't happen all the time, but occasionally we do have something super strange. Um, you know, like the cube uh, that we, we will remote view. And I remember when I got that target, I had no idea what I was remote viewing because a lot of times uh, I get sent, a set of numbers and I'm told, Hey, do this target if you have time. And, um, and I do it and it could be the Eiffel tower. I mean, it could be a practice target. It could be a missing person. You know, um, I actually find missing people sometimes, you know, I get a high priority target and, uh, and you know, I, I'm, I'm asked to try to help locate people. And, uh, a lot of times it's cold cases and, uh, it, Every single time I've had one, um, it's pretty much been someone who was deceased. So I've only, but I have found animals, you know, my friend's pets that went missing and things like that. And they were alive. So that's good. But, um, but yeah, I, you know, remote viewing can be utilized in several different ways. And, uh, and, and just being able to help find missing people and locate any kind of target is, is really fun for me. I mean, it's actually a hobby for me. 
Have you ever remote viewed UFOs and their occupants? We have actually had to um, remote view something similar to that. Now, a lot of the things that I remote view of my team, we don't talk about because it's kind of private with my team, but I can say, yes, we have. And uh, yes, there have been, um, there have been some very interesting targets. And a matter of fact, I just started a new show on Friday nights called Remote Viewing Investigations, where I remote view uh, paranormal attacks on people, alleged paranormal attacks, um, usually having something to do with a Bigfoot. OK, and so, um, you know, we just thought that was something really interesting to look at. Uh, and I, I will be remote viewing some UFO uh incidents and things like that in the future. But so far, I've, I've pretty much just done a couple of Bigfoot investigations and a ghost investigation, the Bell Witch. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm planning to do some uh, UFO investigations coming up. So, um, but I can say yes, I have, we have absolutely uh, remote viewed some ET alien stuff. Oh my goodness, that is so exciting. And I want to ask you more, but you're saying that, I guess not appropriate, but maybe for another time, we'll talk yeah. about it. Just because no, we're coming towards yeah. the break, we'll be right back. Okay. gigawatt paranormal powerhouse KUNX DB VX This is Micah Hanks of the Micah Hanks program right here on KUNX and right now you're having your paradigm shifted by the one and only Christina Gomez paranormal then you'll love the unxnetwork.com the x is your streaming audio and video for everything supernatural strange and mysterious like ufos bigfoot ghost and so much more from hosts like jimmy church whitley streamer micah hanks and christina gomez visit the unxnetwork.com show page for a complete list of all the paranormal programs you'll find on the x be sure to follow us on Twitter for updates at KUNXDB. Follow our Facebook group, UNX Network. Find the podcast on Spotify, iHeart, Audible, and Apple Podcast. It's time. It's new. It's the X. X. Hi. Hi. This is Race Hobbs, head of programming at the new UNX Network. And you're locked on Shifting the, the paradigm. paradigm with the intrepid Christina, Christina Gomez. Gomez. On, on the ass. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now, the Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. Howdy, folks. This is Lou Elizondo, and you are listening to my very good friend, Christina Gomez, on Shifting the Paradigm. 
So, you love talk radio, then you'll love TalkStreamLive.com. TalkStream Live is always on, 24-7, with the best streaming talk shows. Find your favorite talkers and discover some new ones. It's free, readily available online, or on mobile with any smartphone or tablet. Finding your favorite talk shows all in one place has gotten a whole lot easier. Just go to TalkStreamLive.com. Be sure to download the free apps from Google Play or the iTunes App Store. Welcome back. With me today is my guest, Jessica Jones, the Cryptid Huntress. And you brought up one of your shows called RVI Remote Viewing Investigations with Jessica Jones. But you also have two other shows, one of them being Into the Portal on KGRA. And you are soon to release a new show called Off the Trails with Spaced Out Radio. Congrats on that. That is so awesome. Can you you describe to us what each of these shows are all about? I know that you did cover the remote viewing one so just the other two can you explain what you cover absolutely well i started my show on kgra digital broadcasting back in october um you know i was a guest on my friend apollo's show there and uh and i was talking about bigfoot and cryptids and uh and through that show being on her show i was asked to start my own show there so um i had Uh, mostly Bigfoot field researchers on my show. It was called Into the Portal, and it was uh, named appropriately after the event that my team experienced out at the Meadow. Okay, a friend of mine, one of my teammates, actually wrote a book about the Meadow and the the portal incident. And uh, and so we, um, you know, I, I wanted to explore the portal more and explore, you know, Bigfoot sightings and Bigfoot research and aliens, ETs, all that stuff. So that's what my show was about, Into the Portal. And I had some of the best Bigfoot field researchers in the field on my show. And uh, not only that, but, you know, people who've written amazing books and, and are researchers that may not be in the field, out in the actual field doing boots on the ground research, but are very knowledgeable in uh, what what we call armchair researchers, I guess you could say, but it's people that do, you know, that are, are doing book research and studying these things without necessarily going into the field. Brilliant, brilliant minds. And I found that when we can all put our, our minds together, it really helps us solve some of these mysteries and maybe not completely solve them, but get a step closer to knowing the truth and finding out the truth. Um, so I just actually had my last show at KGRA uh, with End of the Portal a couple of weeks ago so that I can start my new show at Based Out Radio beginning in May. So um, it's going to be the same type of show there, but I'm going to be on every Saturday and Sunday night. So I'm going to have two shows each weekend and uh, and I'm going to bring the biggest and best in the Bigfoot field, field research in. And uh, and we're going to have great discussions and um, we're going to touch on ghost hunting, UFOs, portals, you know, uh, lizard man, mothman, any kind of cryptids. Um, there's so many, by the way. We even have a bat squatch and a goat squatch and all sorts of other different types of Bigfoots including the dog man. So uh, we're going to be we're going to be touching on all that on my new show. It's spaced out radio. That is so exciting and a lot of really fascinating topics. 
something that we've been talking about a lot lately on today's show is remote viewing. For my younger viewers and listeners who may not know what remote viewing is, can you explain it and how it works from your understanding and experience? Sure. Yeah. Well, remote viewing is basically um, finding a target without, usually without knowing any information about it whatsoever by using, I guess, for lack of a better word, psychic abilities. Okay. So, and anyone can do it. Okay. It's not like I'm a super special because I can remote view. Anyone can be taught to remote view. Okay. So, I'll explain coordinate remote viewing, okay? Because that's what I do the most and that's what I'm best at. Uh, it's the easiest for me. So there are several different modes of remote viewing, including uh, hypnotic remote viewing, energetic remote viewing, all sorts of different types. But I, I usually do coordinate remote viewing because that's one where we actually write it all down. Everything that we experience, we write it down on charts. And uh and so, and it's got the, your name and the date and the location where you are. So let's say, for instance, you're finding a missing person, you know, or you're solving some sort of a crime. It's good to be able to have your, your information written down. And so when you go to say, hey, I know where this missing person is, you know, to the police department. <laughs> They're not looking at you as a suspect. Okay. So, um, but coordinate remote viewing is usually a blind target for me. Okay. And that is where um, a set of numbers is assigned to a target okay and by that i mean random numbers okay it used to be uh, back in the day they would give you an actual coordinate like a latitude and a longitude and you would find that location if you're looking for locations okay um psychically but now with what i'm doing i just get a set of random numbers like one two three four five six seven eight and those numbers are assigned a target okay so let's say you know, uh, I'm going to remote view uh, Patty, the Bigfoot from, uh, you know, the Pacific Northwest. And that day, you know, at Bluff Creek, well, I would be assigned a set of numbers to, you know, remote view that incident, you know, when she was filmed. And uh, as soon as I got those numbers, I would write out my chart. And as soon as my pen hits the paper, you know, my hand starts writing and you, you draw out ideograms. It's kind of... Um, on a different level. It's your subconscious writing. It's almost like automatic writing and your hand will, will draw out some ideograms and you write out everything that comes to your mind, sensory data, um, any, any kind of objects, smells, you know, senses, anything you see, usually songs will come to mind. I'll get song lyrics. You'll get anything. Um, you can smell cologne and perfume. You can uh, detect people if there's a person there. Uh, there's all sorts of stuff you can do. But at the end, you have all this these pages of data. Okay. And, uh, and a lot of times when I don't know what it is, by the end of my session, when nothing else is coming to me anymore, and I have nothing else to write down, I look at my data and I can tell what I just remote viewed and I can put, kind of put it all together and formulate what my target was. Okay. So, um, but of course not all of my targets are blind. So, you know, I'm able to be front loaded is what we call it. And, uh, and, and basically it's just pulling information out of the matrix, you guys. So it's just like in the ethers, it's almost like I have the intention of locating this target. And as soon as I get into my remote viewing mode, um, everything just starts pouring in all the information just opens up and it just starts flooding in. And, uh, and it's my job just to write it down and take it all in. So that's kind of how we locate a target. Now it was used back, you know, during the cold war um, by governments all over the world as psychic spies. Okay. So <laughs> there's movies written about it. I believe that a lot of governments probably still use remote viewers because it's very effective in locating targets and finding people and, um, you know, researching uh, locations of where the enemy's hiding and things like that, I'm sure. Um, and it, it, it's just it's a very effective way of locating things that you are trying to find. So that's that's how we, you know, we we use it in the field. And uh, like I said, we use it when we um, are trying to look, you know, further into any kind of occurrence that happened to us while we were out in the field. 
One remote viewer that I recently researched was Pat Price, and he was a pretty well-established remote viewer and a part of the government. And he had stated that there was an alien base in Alaska. Have you heard anything about that or remote viewed Alaska yourself when it comes to alien bases or just alien bases anywhere across the globe? Yeah, well... I have remote viewed some very interesting things that were not on our planet. <laughs> okay. So, no, I have not remote viewed anything um, that had to do with an alien base that I knew of on our planet. So, no, I have not. But um, I have definitely heard about those things. And I do believe that there are bases, uh, you know, all over our planet and probably in the mountains and, you know, um, there's there's no telling uh, the more that i'm getting into especially these paranormal attacks that i've been remote viewing the more i'm seeing that there's a huge cover-up by our governments on a lot of things that um i think the public deserves to know and maybe it's just because a lot of the public's not ready to hear it or maybe that's what they they think is that we're not ready for disclosure yet on all of this stuff but um i'm one of the people that does believe that there are certain bases all over the place. If I wanted to start training my mind or any of my listeners and viewers, what advice would you give to get started? Wow, very interesting. Um, well, you can start by, you know, uh, there's a program called the Monroe Gateway Program, okay? And it's all about the, the binaural beats. And, uh, and it's really just doing that, that entire process there. So I tell a lot of people, get started on the Monroe Gateway Program, okay? And it's accessible to anybody. Matter of fact, you can find it on Spotify, I just found the other day. So you guys go to the Monroe Gateway Program, but really it's all about getting your mind right and quietening your mind and just finding um, almost like finding peace and meditating because it's all about learning your brain waves too and learning how to get into the theta state, okay? Um, and a lot of people do that just by meditating alone. But it has to do um, with really just getting your, your mind straight and, and getting all of the noise out of your head, okay? It's also about recognizing energy shifts and su the subtleties in energy. You know, I remember when we were training uh, in the beginning, we were just basically being told, you know, walk from one room to the next and feel it, it experience like, you know, see what the difference is in the energy shift. Okay. So I love the fact that I'm able to just pick up on any kind of energy these days, you know, especially people, because at this day and time, we live in a really crazy world and it's good to be able to read people's energy. Okay. And I know that I'm a remote viewer and I've been training for a long time, but, you know, I grew up with, um, you know, I don't, I wouldn't call it, I guess it was kind of a gift of, of being able to be psychically switched on, you know, and, um, and it, and that's a valuable thing to have these days is just to be able to read people's energies and stuff. But yeah, you can also benefit by um, decalcifying your pineal gland, okay? And um, cutting fluoride out of your toothpaste in your water, okay? Um, you know, our psychic abilities have been under attack for many, many years. And, uh, and, and I think that's by design, okay? So if you could just get a really good water filter that will possibly take out the fluoride in your water, I, I highly recommend that. Um, just taking steps to, um, you know, get that third eye going again, okay? Maybe even doing some Reiki, getting a, a you know, booking a Reiki session with an energy healer uh, just to get your chakras flowing and to, to open up that third eye and that crown chakra is huge, you know? Um, yeah, I think, I think those are some of my biggest tips right there. Well, I learned that you are a certified interdimensional Reiki energy healer. Can you explain what that title entails? And also, what's the difference between an interdimensional Reiki healer and just a Reiki healer? Well, you know, that is something that my friend Joel uh, created himself. He is who taught me uh interdimensional uh, Reiki and it's basically normal Reiki, but he takes all the different, um, all the different lineages of it and he combines it into one. And so it's kind of like a, it's like a, a an amazing 
just it's multidimensional and you know we're all multidimensional beings right so um it makes sense to me but you know i'm only certified in level one so, but hey that's something right so <laughs> um but yeah it's um it's just something that um joelle is um an, an expert in like he he's amazing but it's multi-dimensional is just a combination of different types of reiki you know there's there's different modes of it and he combined them all into one and so that's the difference oh that makes more sense you're also part of the north georgia cryptid researchers group this yes. is a topic i've received a good amount of interest from with my younger audience can you share with us some of the more exciting cases with cryptids that you've investigated every single case that we've done and you know we don't really go around doing a whole lot of investigations on people's properties and things like that but we have um but it's more or less um just the research that we do out in the field uh the north georgia cryptid researchers we're all you know all three of the groups that i'm in we're, we all work together all you know it's a lot of the same people from the different groups but we're just all kind of in different locations so um yeah i mean We've had a lot of crazy things happen. Um, I can't think specifically just with the North Georgia Cryptid researchers because we're, it all kind of melds together to me. But, um, you know, they're, they're the same groups that go out and, um, we have, uh, the UFO activity that happens. And yes, we've had plenty of, uh, experiences with the Bigfoots, but every time we have something Bigfoot going on, we have, orbs and things that happen. So I can tell you, I'll tell you a, a couple of good stories. Uh, there was a, a weekend that we were up in the mountains and, um, you know, we were just minding our own business in base camp and suddenly something came screaming at us through the base camp. And I'm going to tell you, that was the only time I've ever actually kind of been scared because I don't get scared very easily. We are all inoculated. Okay. And if you guys don't know what inoculated is, it means that we just are kind of used to it, <laughs> used to all the weird stuff. But um, we were um, getting ready to just kind of, I guess we we're going to go out that night and go do some hiking through the woods. And um it was getting dark and something screamed really loud behind our tent and it was not an animal and it was not a human. Okay. And it was so loud and it sounded like a woman moaning, but like in terror and just like an animal, it was, it was just this weird thing. And it, it unless you experience it, just like with a lot of Bigfoot experiencers, unless you've been there, it's really hard to explain, okay? But it wasn't scary enough for me to get in my car and leave. I ended up staying. And, um, and you know, and it didn't sleep at all that night, by the way. Um, but, you know, a lot of times when we'll be, it, you know, we have a base camp set up usually where we all, you know, we stay and have a campfire and have at least one person that stays back with um does the communications for our team you know we all carry ham radios we have our our walkie talkies our cbs and uh and we dispatch into teams and let me tell you we never go out by ourselves because we know how dangerous it is um especially after encountering that portal um so we don't go out alone and um but we always keep somebody back at base camp to uh you know keep track of where everybody's at and all that kind of stuff and uh we've gotten back to base camp and uh you know everybody's going to bed and falling asleep and the snores start you know happening you hear people snoring over this way and snoring over that way and that's usually when the bigfoots will walk up and they'll start whooping to each other and triangulating all around the camp and uh, and whistling and stuff like that. So, you know, that's that's something that's not totally uncommon out there. Now, if you want the most exciting story uh, that I have, well, I have a couple of very exciting stories. Um, you know, I can't say that I've ever seen a Bigfoot face to face. OK, and I've been out doing pretty serious field research for 11 years okay but one of the first times i ever went out i was um dared to be bait okay and if you've ever been on a bigfoot expedition there's usually the newbie that gets to be bait 
And uh, I, I kind of, I don't say a volunteer, but I was, I was totally down with it. I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll totally be bait because I want to see if Bigfoot's real, right? So um, I was out with a team of guys, and since I was the only female, they were like, you know, Bigfoot likes ladies. Okay, so I, uh, I was dared to basically walk through an open field up to a tree line, and it was about a football field long, like about a hundred yards, right? And so I was like, yeah, you know, I put on my big girl pants and and I um, took a deep breath and I started walking and I knew that the guys would watch me through their cameras. And if something got me, they could at least tell my mom, Jessica got taken off by Bigfoot, you know, <laughs> so um, so I did it and I walked. Uh, I got about halfway up the field. And I was, I was feeling pretty brave. And about that time, I heard somebody running up behind me, full speed behind me, like kind of from the side behind me on my right side. And as it got closer, I thought it was one of the guys playing a trick on me. And I thought they were going to scare me because I didn't know these people that well at that point. And um, whatever it was, knock my legs out from underneath me from behind and it then it just kept going i mean i i felt the energy i heard it something absolutely swept my legs out from underneath me and it kept going right past me and i jumped up in the air and my arms flailed around a little bit but i didn't fall down nonetheless it was really weird and so I sat there for a minute and I thought, man, that was really weird. What do I do? You know, I didn't want to look like a, a baby, you know, so I just kept walking. I just kept it moving. And uh, and I, I made it almost up to the tree line when I heard someone walking up behind me. And it was one of the guys. And he wanted to make sure I was OK, because apparently throwing my arms up in the air was the distress call. So he came to make sure I was OK. And um, and I was fine. But. It was very odd and it was very weird. And I didn't um, I didn't know at the time that Bigfoots are known to cloak and they can go invisible. It was according to what people said. And uh, they could go invisible and they like to play with you, especially the juveniles, the younger ones. Um, they just like to run up behind you and mess with you. Now, I never felt any kind of malice. I did not feel like there was someone trying to hurt me. Um, however, I did feel like they were trying to play with me and it was kind of like a, I gotcha moment, you know? Um, and so that was, that was actually really cool. Now that same trip, but the next night, uh, a teammate and I decided to go back up to that same field. And, uh, you know, uh, later oh, that first night when I, I got my legs knocked out from under me, um, the the my teammate actually said that I was standing in front of the tree line and a Bigfoot looked out from behind a tree right in front of me. Now I didn't see that, so I can't say for positive that it happened. I do trust him, but I didn't see it with my own eyes. Okay, because I didn't have a thermal camera. Uh, but that so the next night we decided to go back to that field because we had had that activity, and that is when my partner and I, the guy who had seen the Bigfoot, peep its head around the tree. We had um, UFO activity that entire evening. Um, he and I had planned to go out there around 3 p.m. the next day and set up a little, you know, set up in the, the in the woods, like inside the tree line, wearing our camo. And he had a ghillie suit and all that stuff. And we were going to blend into the environment and um, stay there until you know, probably midnight that night. I mean, we were out there until one in the morning. It was so long. But um, but he and I went out there and the, the goal was to sit out and um, blend into the environment. And then our crew, like our group was going to come up around nine o'clock at night and act like normal everyday humans, making noise and beating drums and just acting crazy so that the Bigfoots would pay attention to them and possibly walk out of the tree line to look at them and step on top of my buddy and I. <laughs> so we had a big plan. Okay. And, uh, and so we, um, we did that and it got to be about dark and, uh, and he and I started seeing strange lights as we were sitting there waiting for our team to come down. And so we started seeing really strange lights and on the side of a mountain right beside us, there was a white light 
and it was moving in a horizontal direction across the mountain. And so we thought, wow, there must be a car over there. But then we realized there's no trail for a car. Okay, there's no way for a car to get up there on that side of the mountain. So then we thought, well, it must be a person holding a lantern, maybe some hikers. But then we realized there's no trail at all where that light was. And it looked like it was over the trees. So, okay, so we, we saw that that was really weird. Um, it eventually disappeared. Um, we started looking into the sky. The sky was completely clear that night. And as we were looking up, there are lights, like little like airplanes, but they were moving in triangular designs and diagonals. It wasn't airplanes. <laughs> they weren't airplanes and uh, they weren't satellites. So we were um, noticing all of that. We also had um, equipment malfunctioning and losing time and all that kind of stuff. So that's why we ended up um, learning remote viewing was because of that incident. Jessica, we're coming towards the break. We'll be right back after this. Million gigawatt paranormal powerhouse KUNX DB VX. This is Jimmy Church of Fade to Black, and you are in the future because you're listening to Christina Gomez and shifting the paradigm. Race Hobbs with the X. Obviously, if you're listening to this, you have an interest in unexplained phenomena like ghosts, Bigfoot, and UFOs. And by now, you know that we have our own X blog, the UnX newsletter, and the UnX magazine quarterly. But most of you don't know that we have started our very own paranormal conference. And this year, for safety, this two day XCon will be virtual. So you can attend from the comfort of your home. XCon presenters include Whitley Strieber, Micah Hanks, Mark. G.K. and Preston Dennett, Jimmy Church, Lisa Martin and Wayne Lawrence, Lee Spiegel, Debbie Zegelmeyer, Dan Terry, Kate Grabowski, and Ray Hernandez. There will also be a live paranormal investigation by the Riverside, Iowa Paranormal Team. So come hang out with us in the safety of home as we set out to explain the unexplained Friday, May 13th, and Saturday the 14th, 2022. And tickets are on sale now. Go to unnextnetwork.com. That's unxnetwork.com. Are you ready to read about true paranormal events? Unex Media publishes nonfiction books about UFOs, ghosts and haunted places, time anomalies, cryptid creatures, and more. Just like KUNXDB Radio, it's all about unexplained phenomena. Visit www.unxmedia.com to see our list of great book titles by Debbie Ziegelmeyer, Gene Walker, Devin Listrom, Wayne Lawrence, Bill Spicer, and yours truly, Margie K. That's unxmedia.com. Gold loves chaos, uncertainty, and disarray. History shows us what gold does when people aren't sure, aren't sure about the government, the stock market, their jobs, or their retirement savings. Our national debt is skyrocketing. Gold and other precious metals are a defense measure against inflation and a stock market that might take years to recover. So what can you do right now to protect yourself? Call United Gold Group. We offer gold and other precious metals delivered securely within 72 hours. Are you worried about 
the stock market, we can also help you set up a real gold or silver IRA or a 401k. Safe and secure, United Gold Group makes gold ownership affordable. Call now and get up to $2,500 in free gold or silver with a qualified IRA. Call 800-753-8534. That's 800-753-8534 or visit unitedgoldgroup.com. of your story and from your research, boots on the ground experience and speaking to other experts, do you believe there is a connection between UFOs and Bigfoot? I do. I do. There is some weird connection. Now, uh, the more I research, the less I know. Okay. I thought I had all the answers when I first started um, doing this, but there's a lot of times there is UFO activity in the environment while we're doing Bigfoot research. Okay, there's also ghost activity. There's also portals. Okay, so it in some weird, crazy way, it's all connected. Now, I have not come to any kind of conclusion as to how it's all connected, but we just know that we experience a lot of other activity. Now, we always have portal, or not portals, orbs. We always have orbs. Okay, so orbs are what okay there's different types of orbs we don't know what orbs are but i have seen video of orbs that were like metallic that shot down from the sky and turned into aliens and the aliens ran around and then they turned back into orbs and shot back off okay from a credible source okay so something that blew my mind i've also seen just lights um, a lot of lights. We, we encounter a lot of lights, a lot of different colored lights in the woods. A lot of times there'll be twinkling lights in the trees and stuff. And yes, this a lot of these things can be explained away. You know, there have been times where we've seen lights in the trees and it turned out just to be stars in the background when the when the leaves would move, when the wind blow, when the wind was blowing. So um, also there's orbs that we have, you know, captured on our game cams and, and trail cams that have faces in them. <laughs> okay, so um you know, it, I think that there there's so many different types of orbs that um, you can't really just define it, define it as you know being ET or um, ghost or whatever. So you know, it, it's it's confusing because you know as much time as we've spent researching, we really, we don't have all the answers to all of that. But I do find a connection between Bigfoot and spacecraft and aliens. Um, what it what it is, I'm not sure, but but a lot of times uh, they're all in their environment together. And why do you think that is? Do you think that maybe one attracts the other, or is it because of a, of a portal or some kind of um, field that attracts these things? I mean, why do you think this is all happening in in very concentrated points across the globe? That's interesting. I, I don't know. You know, some people say um, ley lines, you know, it's just these areas of high strangeness. Uh, maybe they're using the same technology to come in and out of 
our atmosphere. I mean, um, it could be the portals. Considering that we do have a, a portal documented, you know, and, and our teammates walked into it. I mean, who's to say that the Bigfoots and the aliens are not coming in and out of those things as well? So, um, you know, I don't know. That's a that's a great question. Um, you know, I, I don't know where they come from or where they go. And a lot of people in the field will debate that and say, you know, they don't believe that Bigfoot is interdimensional or comes in and out of portals. You know, I'm on a, a team of some guys that are Bigfoot uh, researchers and have a podcast called Texas Front Porch. And, uh, and we all have different opinions on it. And we've all been out in the field and we've all done research, but we all have experienced different things. And so it's really fun to get to listen to all of those different opinions and us trying to figure things out by just kind of putting our heads together and our experiences together. And, you know, and I say never discount what anyone has to say, especially if it's someone who's experienced something paranormal, um, because a lot of times it's very hard to explain those things. And it's even harder to talk to people about it. And so that's why I appreciate being uh, having a platform and being able to talk about this Um because I've been there and I know how scary it is and it can be very traumatic. And, uh, and I, I'm just, I want people to know that they're not alone and uh, we're all experiencing this together. With all of the research investigations and podcasts you do covering all these fascinating topics, which specific area of interest really is your favorite to cover and to talk about? My favorite is the Bigfoot field research because it's it's just fun for me and I love it. I mean, I love talking about remote viewing because I think that it's something that I wish everyone could do and would do because imagine having a world of psychically switched on humans. I mean, this would be a completely different place. So I really love doing that, but I've been, um, it's not that I was hesitant to start doing a show about remote viewing, but not everyone is so open to it as they are Bigfoot, you know, at the moment. And so I figured maybe we could kind of segue into remote viewing via Bigfoot. Okay. So that's my, that's my goal. <laughs> so, but I do love, um, I love talking about Bigfoot in the research because it's fascinating. And, um, and the evidence that my team has and people from all over the country have, I love to showcase it on my show, just like the tree twist, the tree twists alone. Uh, these Bigfoots are out there twisting trees over and over again, 12 times and splintering trees everywhere. And it just it, it blows my mind to see this kind of stuff and the footprints and the casting and um, the video. You know, you'd be shocked at how many Bigfoots Sasquatches are on video. And I know there's a lot of people out there that have, um, you know, tried to hoax these things. And, um, you know, I've also had people on my show who are media experts and are into film and are, are experts in figuring out what's a hoax and what's not. Uh, and so I try to hit it from all angles. Okay. Because I am, um, you know, we've all got to be a little skeptical and, uh, and it's, it's important to have people on my show that I can trust and that I know their research is legitimate. And, uh, you know, because there's, there, you gotta, we've got to maintain the integrity of the research and the research field. And, uh, and that's kind of, and that's my goal, but just the evidence alone blows my mind and, uh, and, and getting to learn about, you know, Bigfoot language. I just recently did a show on Bigfoot language and my friend, Joel, who taught me interdimensional Reiki came on my show. He was my guest because he speaks light language and talks about light codes. And so that's a whole other level to all of this as well. And, uh, you know, Bigfoots have their own language. And if you uh, listen to the Sierra sounds by Ron Moorhead and, uh, and his, uh, one of his research partners back in the seventies um, and fast forward it to, I guess it was the two thousands when R Scott Nelson found those tapes and, um, is a, a, a linguist for the, um, for the, I think it was in the Navy for the government. And he heard an actual language that those Bigfoots were speaking. And so, um, was able to pull out, you know, identify the phenomes and, and, and see that they were speaking in different dialects from archaic Japanese to German to, um, English to Spanish to, you know, having Native American dialects in there and, 
it's just fascinating. Okay, so that is what I like to touch on is the Bigfoot research because um, it, it just it blows my mind. <laughs> It has to, especially some of these recordings that have been caught on tape. The one that really blew my mind that I had just recently heard were the uh, samurai speaking Bigfoot. I think it's like what it's yeah. actually called. I don't know. Obviously, we don't know what dialect that is, but it sounds like samurai, Jap angry Japanese people speaking. But um, from the researchers evidence, right? <laughs> hearing these tapes, they were saying, no, it's actually Bigfoot. And I, I found that so fascinating, so interesting. And honestly, it made me smile thinking th there are so many things that we simply do not understand. And yeah. our minds are opening every single day, the more that we are involved in these types of topics. Yeah. Yeah. The, the samurai is called samurai chatter. And that's the form of the archaic Japanese. And so, you know, and, and a lot of people believe that uh, Bigfoots are a form of an ancient being, that they are the keepers of the earth, you know, and they go back way before humans. And so, you know, as to what the, the Bigfoots are, I'm not sure, you know, are they just a, a primitive form of a human, you know, because they just, they look like, um, they look like humans. And a lot of people, when they see a Bigfoot, they actually describe it as being just a large human with a lot of hair on it. Okay. <laughs> but not a lot of hair on their face. So um, now have these Bigfoots spent time all over this world and picked up all these different languages over the years, you know, and are, heard humans speaking these languages and integrated it into their own. You know, it's very interesting to think about. And so, um, yeah, that's that's part of why I love talking about Bigfoot and having a show about it. When being so engulfed in the field of the paranormal cryptids or practicing to have to having heightened abilities, life usually takes a turn from normal to abnormal. And there can be different reasons for that. Either our perception changes or we begin to attract certain things. How has your life changed since being involved in all of this in the last decade? Oh, wow. It is really, like like I was saying earlier, it really um, put me on the path of my spiritual journey, okay? And so I, um, it, it has opened me up immensely, but it has also made me realize that we are able to manifest our reality, okay? So when we had the, the UFO encounter out in the field, okay, when I was doing Bigfoot field research, I had the UFO out encounter, and um, I was it was recommended that my entire team uh, start researching alien abductions. Okay. And so I started researching alien abductions because we thought maybe my partner and I had been abducted. Okay. So, um, but we weren't sure. So we started studying that and I got books like the threat communion, uh, alien agenda. Okay. And, uh, and I was reading those and um, lo and behold, I woke up at night and I had ETs in my bedroom. Okay, so that's, that's how my life uh, changed and got a lot more weird. Okay, is when I started um, doing research and, and then it was almost like these things were manifesting into my reality. Um, I don't know if I manifested it or if they've always just been there and I was able to see them finally, you know, um, but yeah, once you start researching Bigfoot and aliens portals your life completely changes it really does because you're breaking out of this 3d matrix reality that we are taught to live in and expanding your consciousness beyond the boundaries and beyond measure and so i realize we are limitless beings okay we all have enhanced human capabilities and it's up to us to learn that and to start using it and utilizing it and uh, and i and i learned that by going out in the field and looking for bigfoot so um you know i, I think that every time someone has a bigfoot encounter whether they want to or not <laughs> Because a lot of people stumble across Sasquatch by accident, you know, by um, being out in the woods or driving down a road at night. And, you know, a Sasquatch will run out in front of their car, um, things like that. It jolts people into a whole new reality and it makes people see life differently. And so in a sense, it's raising the vibration. It's raising your frequency. It's very traumatic. It can scare the pants off of you, but it can also 
open you up to a whole new world and really raise that consciousness. And I think that that's what our planet needs right now is to raise the consciousness of everybody on this planet. Okay. Because our entire environment, our earth is changing right now and we are, um, the vibration is rising. And with that, we need to rise as well. And we need to lift our vibration and our consciousness. And, uh, and I think a good way to do that is through a Bigfoot experience. <laughs> Backing up a little, you stated that you saw aliens in your room. What did they look like? I mean, do you still see them today or yes. was it just a, a one time encounter? Yeah, well, I, I don't see I have not seen them since because what I did was I shut that down. I quit studying it and I quit um, having the intention of you know, encountering aliens again. So I, I, sh I had to shut it down because it got really weird. <laughs> okay. So um, the first encounter, I believe the first one was the two, I had two that were like grays that were in my room. And uh, it was very brief. Okay. A, a brief encounter because I guess I fell back to sleep and I don't know if I meant to do that or they put me to sleep. <laughs> Uh, the second time I, I woke up to a big, gigantic hooded figure standing by my bed and uh, it, it looked like the Grim Reaper. But uh, the way it moved, you know, aliens don't move like humans. And so it was um, it had weird movements and it had its hands up in this weird way that looked like um, an insect. So it uh, yeah, I, I can't describe too much of it because it was cloaked. But I believe it looked like a praying mantis. So, um, but it was really big. <laughs> and, uh, and yeah, I felt I fell asleep uh, pretty much right after I saw it. And I had a very strange dream after that. Well, what was the dream about? And my other question is, what were you feeling? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I, I, I'd like to say that I'm inoculated to all the high strangeness. So I'm never terrified of this stuff. I haven't been um, terrified because I've been experiencing ghost by my bed at night you know since i was a, a teenager and uh and so i'm i'm kind of used to it to the high strangeness and i know that you know i haven't been hurt yet you know and uh and so it it did not seem threatening to me um the dream that i had was i was surrounded by a bunch of i like to call them like the munchkins from the wizard of oz <laughs> and uh it was they didn't look like that they were just smaller sized people and um, and they kept telling me to stop hurting the mayor is what they were saying. So it was like I was I was attacking an authority figure and they kept telling me that I was going to get them in trouble. And uh, it was it was basically like it could have been a screen memory. You know, I think I was fighting perhaps and I was being told by the smaller beings to stop fighting. <laughs> so it was something like that. But in my memory, it was. Um, it was almost like a scene from the Wizard of Oz. So it was very odd. <laughs> it was a really weird dream. Uh, and I woke up the next morning and I thought, man, that was a weird dream. And then I remembered that I had had that gigantic being by my bed right before I had that dream. So, yeah, it's not uncommon for me to have weird experiences like that. As an avid outdoors woman and one that does a lot of investigations in forested areas how has david politis's research such as his missing 411 books and documentaries affected you well you know it's actually been very beneficial to me and to my um to my team because well we were already aware of the the high strangeness out in the the woods and you know david politis i believe was a bigfoot field researcher uh as well just like my team so um yeah I, I i think that it's really benefited us because he gives really good information not only is he uh, documenting all these missing cases but he's also letting people know what to do and what not to do when you're out in the woods because there are patterns and if you read his series every chapter is a different missing person's case um and it shows you a pattern. Okay. And so these people, it's always, you know, don't be the last one in line when you're walking with your, your hiking team, you know, um, don't go pick berries, <laughs> you know, by yourself. Um, it's, uh, he's, he says, take a, a, a personal locator device. You know, people who have a gun, a weapon are usually less likely to be taken or disappear. And so, um, 
it's uh he's got some really good advice but um but really what it's done it's been beneficial in bringing awareness to people across the globe you know he he touches on north america um in his research for the most part and so you know and i'm down here in georgia and uh and we have clusters of missing people down here in the research areas that we that we um do our research in so um which makes me wonder are those people going into these portals um you know i did a show not too long ago about um the cave systems and you know the cave systems correlate to you know on a map with not only the deep underground bases a lot of them but with missing people clusters and so it's it's just a really it's a, a gem that he's written these books okay because you, it puts puts it out there where you can see where the missing people clusters are and it's all in these national forests okay for the most part so who knows what you know uh i i, I tend to believe that our government knows about this stuff and knows where these people are going especially doing this remote viewing show uh, every friday night and really diving into these paranormal attacks so yeah it, it's uh it, it's it's really um it's really beneficial. And if you're ever going to go out in the woods and go hiking or take your family camping, I recommend reading his series. I'm, I'm a pretty big fan of Dave Politis. And I, I think that when you watch his content, either his YouTube channel, read his books, or even watch his documentaries, it's really all about safety at the end of the day, really taking those extra precautions to make sure that you're going to be fine and to return back to your family. So I'm I'm someone that really enjoys listening to what he has to say and the cases that he covers as well. What are your thoughts on the stories of people witnessing Bigfoot disappear in thin air or entering and exiting trees? Are they just imagining things or is there something really to those stories? Completely valid. Absolutely. I am a, a firm believer that they are interdimensional beings. And uh, it, my team, we've been out in the field enough to um, be, be tracking Bigfoot and the footprints disappear out of nowhere, you know, into thin air. And, you know, I've had guests on my show who are part of my team and people that are even aren't on my team and people that I've done shows with and been interviewed by who have said, you know, they'll hear footsteps, especially if they're sleeping at night and, uh, and, and they'll be laying in their sleeping bag and the footsteps will come by their tent and then a flash of light happens and then all of a sudden the footsteps are gone, okay? We've had personal experiences where things have just disappeared appeared and disappeared out of thin air. So yes, I do believe that they are um, opening up some sort of interdimensional portal, wormhole, something. They're going somewhere. And, uh, and a lot of people, uh, some researchers will say that Bigfoot goes into the caves and sleeps there. And, you know, they have bedding areas and things like that. But, you know, the places where my team researches, we don't find a lot of that. And, um, I think they're going somewhere now. I do know that uh, they're known to migrate and, uh, and and they probably do. Some of them do use the cave systems. I mean, humans and um, every people have used the cave systems for for since the beginning of time, you know, to for shelter and for even traveling and you know, for hiding and things like that for safety. But do I think Bigfoots are going in and out of the caves and snatching up humans and taking them out because it it relates to the missing people. A lot of people would say that maybe Bigfoot's grabbing people and taking them into the cave system. You know, I don't believe that's the case. I think that they are uh, coming in and out of portals personally. Jessica, I just have one last question for you. You stated on your YouTube channel, which is called Cryptid Huntress, and you stated that you believe in reincarnation and that we come back to learn lessons with each life. The path that you've taken in this life, being a remote viewer and being involved in Bigfoot research and the paranormal, what do you think these things are trying to teach you in this lifetime? Yeah, yeah. You know, just about your spiritual journey and opening up and elevating your consciousness. You know, I think that part of my um, mission here on Earth is to help other people 
wake up and to elevate their consciousness. And I think that's why I'm here today talking to you is, um, you know, I think that I've been here many lifetimes, probably doing the same thing that I'm doing right now. <laughs> and you probably too have too, Christina. So it's, um, you know, I, I, I'm just learning that there's more to this life than what we've been taught. OK, there is so much more. And, uh, and it's just a matter of opening your eyes and having an open mind and getting out of your comfort zone and experiencing all that this life has to offer, because we're not here to live small in these little tiny boxes, you know, that we're kind of taught to live in and to not step out of line. We're meant to shine. Every single one of us here, we're meant to shine and to go out and have fun and experience life and really um, do things that scare us every now and then. I mean, do something that scares the hell out of you at least once a year. OK, because <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's what I do is for. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yes, but you know, if you're going to go out and, and search for Bigfoot, please take someone with you and never go out by yourself. And it's always safety first. Okay, so I agree with David Politis. And, um, and also, you know, just just get your mind straight, uh, get your mind right and, uh, and take someone with you and, and you'll be just fine. <laughs> Jessica, this has been so fascinating, but we've come to the end of the show. Where can people find you on social media to stay up to date with your research? Well, Okay, first of all, you can go to my website. It's uh, thecryptedhuntress.com and all of my social media is posted there on that site. Of course, I have a, a YouTube channel, The Cryptid Huntress. So you guys go subscribe. Um, I not only post um, all of my shows that are live, they stream live through my, my YouTube channel, but I, I try to post daily um, Oracle card readings and spiritual guidance kind of stuff. It's just for fun. You know, I have a good time doing that. Um, also, I'm on Instagram at The Cryptid Huntress. And I have a shop called War Woman Goods. So that's kind of how I sponsor all of my stuff that I do, uh, where I sell Native American jewelry and things like that. So um, go check it out. And uh, yeah, uh, the main site is thecryptedhuntress.com. Thank you so much. Thank you. I had a blast. I appreciate you having me. You're listening to the UnX Network. KUNXDB, Kansas City, Missouri. I hope you enjoyed today's show. It was such a pleasure and honor to speak with Jessica Jones, the Cryptid Huntress. I think we covered so much in a short time frame that I would love to have her on again to go over more details on certain phenomena. There is an extra segment that is accessible for my Patreon community where more questions are asked and ones that you simply do not want to miss. I want to wish you all a wonderful week. Please like this video or podcast on your platform of choice and share it with those who have the same interest. Subscribe if you haven't already, because there's a lot more great shows coming to you soon. Be safe and remember, keep your eyes on the skies. Thank you.